Welcome to the Global Prayer Network, with Rev. Dr. Seth O. Lardy. We pray this teaching will impact your life, and bring you closer in your walk with Jesus. Let's get ready to receive today's teaching from, Rev. Dr. Seth O. Lardy. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father in heaven, we have been adopted into your family through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came and he lived among us. He died for us. He rose again. And the scripture tells us that as many as believe in him, he gave them the power to become sons and daughters of God. And so today, Father, as we uh, have been blessed to enter into this new day, this new month, we ask for your guidance. We ask for your peace. We ask for your love. For you have said to us, if and when we delight in you, you'll give us the desires of our hearts. And so, God, I thank you today that you're blessing us with the desire, first and foremost, to be in your presence. So we ask now that you bless your word and give your word success. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. And thanks be to God. The Bible is not a book of ideas, suggestions, or opinions. That's not what the Bible is. The truth is that the Bible is a book of instructions. It's a book of laws. It's a book of commandments. It's a book of statutes and precepts, principles that God has given to us whereby we must live. The universe is not an accidental entity. The universe did not just come about without any plan, any purpose, any intelligence. The universe is actually a result of the spoken word of God. On yesterday, the Lord blessed us. We were with uh, Alpha and Omega in their worship service. And I was sharing with them how the word of God is so important that God is obligated to fulfill his words. And one of the reasons that God is obligated to fulfill his word is because the entire universe is held up like pillows that will hold up a building. The universe is held up. And not only is it held up, but it is held together. The universe operates based upon the word of God. And so if one word of God is not manifested, imagine sitting on a chair that has four legs and one of the legs get broken and you try to sit in it, you are going to fall. You are going to fall. Well, that's the way it is with the universe. That's why God is so particular about his word. The only reason why sometimes the word of God doesn't work is when we are not prepared to execute the word of God. That's one. And sometimes the reason why we think it is not working because it's not yet time. With God, everything has time. But don't worry. If God gave you a word you can rest assured that word will come to pass. It will, it shall. There is nothing that will hold that word up. 
it will come to pass. Because God's word can never fail. He said before one word fails, heaven and earth will be destroyed. So the word of God, I want to encourage you, is not just a book of ideas and suggestions and opinions. No, there are instructions for living. There are laws for living. There are commandments for living. There are statutes for living. There are precepts and principles for living. And if you live by the word of God, as Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Man should not live just by wearing fine clothes, eating nice food, living in a wonderful home, having a wonderful job. All of those things are good. They're wonderful. But we must live according to the word of God. Why, why, why is it important to live by the word of God? Please remember this. If you never ever remember anything that we've been trying to teach you from and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I want you to remember this. God originally created us in his image and in his likeness. And God said, you know, we should be fruitful, we should multiply, we should replenish the earth, we should subdue, we should have dominion. Well, then by the time we leave Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, and we come to Genesis chapter 3, something happened. The devil came into the garden. The devil who is our arch enemy, as Jesus said, he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The devil came into the picture and deceived Adam and Eve. He deceived them to go against the word of God. And they, they were deceived. They were deceived. And they went against the word of God. And what happened as a result of going against the word of God? They were expelled from the Garden of Eden. And if you are not careful to understand what happened, you will want to get angry. Why would God put them out? No, God put them out in order to prepare them to come back into fellowship with him. Imagine being in a burning house. Imagine being in a house filled with smoke and it's burning up. Would you not want the firemen to come and get you out? Yes. They will get you out, resuscitate you, and then when the house is refurbished, you can come back in the house. That's what happened in the Garden of Eden. It had become a toxic place of disobedience and rebellion. And God could not allow that to continue. And so God put them out to fix them up. He said, I, I will now take out that stony heart, give you a heart of flesh, and I will send my son to pay the price, to pay the penalty, to pay the atoning blood of Christ, and to bring you back into fellowship with us. And so Jesus Christ came, listen to me now. Jesus Christ came so that we can become once again what God intended in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. That's why Jesus came. Anything other than that is, is gravy. It's, 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 it's uh, surplus. The main reason Jesus came is to put us back into the image and the likeness of God. Because until we become like the image and the likeness of God, then we'll experience Genesis chapter four. And what is Genesis chapter four? Suffering, pain, anguish, 
and ultimately death. And so Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. So the question becomes, how do we, how do, we do it? Yes, we accepted Christ Jesus as our Savior and our Lord. But it's just like being born. You know, all of us were born one day. But then after we're born, we needed food. We needed air. We needed water. We needed love. We needed shelter. We needed clothing. We needed a home. We needed a number of things to help us to grow. <clears throat> So when you give your life to Christ, that's not the end of the story. It is now time for you to what? Grow in the things of God. Grow in the word of God. As we said, the Bible is a book of instructions. It's a book of commandments. It's a book of laws. It's a book of precepts. It's a book of principles. Not some ideas and suggestions and opinions. I know that many of us try to do it now and we end up come to the end of the lifespan and we discover, oh Lord, I'm missing out because I would have and I should have followed what God said. So how do we do that? What is the context? What is the environment in which we now grow into the things of God? We said to you, one of the ways to do that is through following the Christian calendar. It starts with Advent. And Advent is a time when we prepare our hearts to receive Christ. Because you know, the Bible says in Matthew 5, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. If your heart is not pure, you will not see God. I don't care how much of white you wear, how many crosses you put around your neck, you just won't see the things of God if your heart is not right. So blessed are the pure in heart, but they should see God. So Jesus came that he will clean out our hearts and through repentance and all of that. So we prepare our hearts to receive Christ. Then that is Advent. Then we move on to Ash Wednesday. And Ash Wednesday, as we said, is a time where we, we, we learn about our mortality. Because as you well know, when you are young, energetic, vivacious, I mean, you're agile, you're going, you don't think about death. No, you don't do that. You, you, you got it going, you, you're excited, you go and you're doing things, making a difference. I mean, you're naming the papers and you know, you're know you doing well in school, in the community, everybody talking about you. You're not thinking about death, no. The story is told about uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in America, a civil rights leader. And uh, he was going all around you know, talking about the laws, talking about justice, talking about being a drum major, et cetera, et cetera. But then it is said that there was a particular individual who was an insurance agent. And he kept following Dr. King, saying, Dr. King, you, you're out here fighting for others, doing everything for everybody else. Have you taken time to think about yourself? Dr. King, you need an insurance policy on your life. But he was not thinking about that. You know, he was Dr. King out here. You know, I have a dream, you know. Yes, he was Dr. King. And finally, accordingly, he listened. And he purchased the insurance, life insurance and was not quite 30 days thereafter, Dr. King was shot and killed. And guess what happened? That insurance policy was the guarantee 
for his family following his death. Because he was the breadwinner. He was the provider of the family. And if the breadwinner is dead, what happens? But because he listened, because he listened and he purchased that life insurance, it paid for his death and everything, his burial rather, everything else. And his family has something to live on. Because you are not thinking about the fact that he will die. But Ash Wednesday is an opportunity, whether you're 12 years old, 10 years old, 6 years old, 1 year, whatever, 90 years old. Ash Wednesday is an opportunity to remind us that indeed, at, as Ecclesiastes, the third chapter will say, there is a time to be born and there's a time to die. And so as you're going about, you know, looking beautiful, looking handsome, everything working well for you and the rest of it, remember to think about such a time and get ready. That's what Ash Wednesday is all about. And Ash Wednesday is, in fact, a time that begins 40 days, 40 long days of Lent. And we talked about what we do during the course of Lent. We, we learn how to fast. We learn about repentance. We learn about self-denial. We learn about reading the word of God. We learn about memorizing the word of God. We learn about meditating upon the word of God. We learn those things during the season of Lent. We learn those things. Today, I want to conclude on the season of Lent and talk about one of the things that we can do during the period of Lent. But let me say before I get into that, listen to this now. If you do not write your story, somebody will write it for you and they will write it in the third person and they won't even know who they're talking about. So it's important for you to write your story. Not only that, but by writing your story, it is one of the ways you can keep on living. It is said that if you want to keep on living, plant a tree, write a book, have some children. Those three ways you can keep on living. And, you know, now you can also add, you can leave an endowment out of which people can be blessed, like the, the Carnegie Endowment, the Ford Foundation, and Lilly Foundation, all of these, you know, they have this money set aside and they use the, the interest to bless and protect and provide for other kinds of uh, endeavors in the universe that they are interested in. So one of the things that we do during the course of the Lent season, we learn to journal. We must learn to journal, to write down our thoughts, write down our experiences, write down our emotions, write it down. What does it mean to journal? Journaling is the act of keeping a record of your personal thoughts, your personal feelings, your personal insights, and more about your spiritual journey. As I was thinking about it, you know, the truth is, if you, if you write down your spiritual journey through your thoughts, your feelings, your insights, etc., you can almost tell if you're stagnant or if you're growing in your faith. When you write it down, writing it down, you can tell it. 
Now, you know, some of us will argue, I don't have time for that. You know, I sing in a choir, that should be enough. I'm chair of the trustees board, that's enough. I'm, I'm, I'm a member of the church, that's enough. You know, my name is on the church road, that's enough. No, friends, journaling is an instruction in the Bible to write things down. Do you know that as a result of writing things down, that's how we have documentaries today. By writing things down, we have history today. By writing things down, we have novels today. We have movies today. Because somebody took the time to write it down. And it's in the Bible. I want you to go with me to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 30. Verse 1 and 2. It says here, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, thus speaks the Lord God of Israel saying, listen to this now, write in a book for yourself all the words that I have spoken unto you. This is what journaling is all about. Writing down your experiences, writing down your thoughts, writing down those things that you are feeling, writing down things that are coming to you. Some of you, believe it or not, God has blessed you with the capacity to see prophetic things, to see visions, to see things that are going to happen. Write them down. Some of you have the ability to dream dreams. Write it down. It's not some opinion. It's not some suggestion. It's God's commandment. It's God's word. Write it down. And God spoke to Jeremiah. Write it down, son. Write it down. Why do you think we have the book of Jeremiah today? Because he decided to do what God said. He wrote it down. Some of you have some dynamic stories of your lives. You have some amazing things that God has done through you. There's some amazing thoughts that are going through your mind. And guess what? Unfortunately, because you didn't write it down, it's buried deep within and beneath your subconscious mind. And nobody knows about it. And if you're not careful, you are going to leave this world with those thoughts. You know, it would try to make it very practical. Some of you have some marvelous recipes. I mean, amazing recipe. The kind of recipe when you get through cooking, you have to basically take off your shirt and your shoes just to enjoy the food. But nobody knows how to replicate, how to duplicate that recipe. And what's going to happen when the Lord calls you home, that's it. Write it down. It's in the book. The Bible encourages us to write it down. Some of you have been a follower of Jesus Christ for over 30, for over 50 years now. And nowhere do you have anything written down about your experiences as a follower of Jesus Christ. And do you not know that you have a particular insight, a particular view of the situation that no one else has? But because you didn't write it down, it would never, ever be known. Writing it down is a part of being obedient to God. Let's look at the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 to 3. A very familiar passage of scripture. We've heard it over and over and over and over about writing it down. You know, Habakkuk had gone to the Lord asking God for some asking God to answer some questions. And God responded. 
It says, then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarish wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. But it's all because you took the time to what? Write down the vision. You know, those of us who are in the business of leadership and administration, we're always talking about writing down the vision, writing down the vision. And one day God helped me to understand something that the vision cannot be some kind of a weak, passive vision. It has to be so impactful that when somebody reads it, they can't help but to run with it. It has to be exciting. It has to be impactful. It has to be enthusiastic. When someone reads it, glory to God, they've got to run with it. Even if you don't run, they keep on running with the vision. But you got to write it down. You got to write it down. Oh, so many of us on this platform, even right now, God has blessed us with so many dynamic, awesome thoughts, ideas, visions, dreams. And what have we done? We have not taken the time to write it down. But the word of God says what? Write down the vision. Here you're talking about tablets and we'll talk more about what you write it down on. But write it down. Journaling is one of the things that we can actually do during the season of Lent, where you can actually write down your thoughts, write down insights, write down things that God will give to you. You know, I was thinking about it. If as adults, we make 35, well, 32 to 35,000 decisions a day, then it means a lot of thoughts are coming through our minds. And what are we doing about them? I encourage you to write it down. It is called journaling. The last scripture I want to share with you this, uh, this afternoon comes out of the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1 and the 19th verse. This is the last book in the Bible. This is the last book in the Bible. And the last book in the Bible is also saying to us, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. John, as you know, on the Isle of Patmos, they had banished him. They had, you know, thrown him away. The system had gotten angry with him and they threw him away. But herein lies the truth. When people don't want you, God needs you. When people think that they have thrown you away, God has a way of coming out and finding you. Look throughout the scriptures. When, 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 when the people were eating up each other and in a starvation situation, who did God use to bring the good news? We're not, you know, the priest, the prophet, and the rest of them. We're some lepers who are on the outside. When Jesus was about to be born, he, he, it was not the priest, prophet, and others, but it was some ordinary shepherds. So here you have John on the Isle of Patmos. He had been banished. Because you were talking about Jesus and they didn't want him to do that. They didn't want him to do anything about Jesus, doing what was right. But they threw him away. But God went and God got him to show him what things were to come. And God said to him through the Holy Spirit, write the things which you have seen. Write the things which are 
and the things which will take place after this time, write it down. My sisters and my brothers, what are the experiences that you're going through? You need to take the time and write it down. Let's talk about the types of journaling that you can do. Number one, personal, very personal. A personal journal is more of a private personal documentation about your feelings, about your doubts, about your aspirations, about your relationships, and most of all, your life goals. What are the things you're trying to achieve in life where you sit down and you write about it? You have personal journal. Then you have also a journal of gratitude. A journal of gratitude. What are the kind of things that you are thankful for? This kind of journaling is one that expresses your experiences in the form of gratitude. What are you thankful for? This morning when you got up, what were the things that you took the time to actually truly be thankful for? Did you write it down? Most of us are guilty of this. What are you thankful for? And I think that if we were to take the time to be thankful, we will not be so eager to still be looking for this, looking for that, looking for the other. Stop and be thankful. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. A gratitude journal. Then you also have a reflective journal. And what is a reflective journal? A reflective journal is the type of journaling that helps you process experiences, emotions, and visions. When you have reflective journal, what it does, it helps accordingly. Now, that's what the people like psychologists and counselors say. They say that if you have a journal that you write down your emotions and your feelings and your thoughts, etc., it can help reduce stress. It can help to reduce stress. One day I went to a, a uh, pharmacy. I had a friend <clears throat> who worked in the pharmacy and he said to me, Doc, did you know that uh, stress is one of the worst killers? Stress can kill you. See, stress, stress, stress is exactly what it is. stretching you beyond your capacity, your limits. You see, when your muscles are supposed to go this far as normal because of certain things that happen to you, it's stretched over here. And then it causes all kinds of trouble. High blood pressure, heart attack, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Stress. And so we have to do what? Process these things. You know, somebody made you angry today. Don't go to sleep without taking time to process. What happened? Why did I get so angry? Was it what the person said to me? Was it how they said it? Was it because something else triggered in my mind? Something similar? What happened? Process that and turn it over to God. Learn how to journal, my sisters and brothers. The process is simple. Choose a media. Are you going to use paper and pencil? Are you going to use a paper and pen or whatever you want to use, computer, word processor, what are you going to do? Then decide the type. Is it going to be personal? Is it going to be reflective? What kind of type you're going to write down? Gratitude, decide. Then you write down the date and the location. Always write down the date and the location. For example, today is September 2nd. The time is at 1242. Where were you on that day? What happened to you? What insight? What things did you learn from it? You write it down in the name of Jesus. And then when you decide, you write and always begin your journal by looking at where you were on that day. And here are some basic tips to develop the habit. You see, because if you haven't been doing it, and you want to get into it, 
then there's some tips to develop the habit of writing down your journal. Number one, set a goal to write down a daily entry. Every day, what happened to you, even if it's just one thing, you know, let's say you decided you'll do a gratitude journal. So every day you decide what, what was it today I need to be thankful for? Who do I need to thank for something that was done for me? I want to thank God, but God used somebody to be a blessing to me. Did I say thank you today? Set a goal. Then write at a convenient time. What was what's the best time for you? Is it when you get ready to go to bed? Is it when you wake up first thing in the morning, in midday? When is the best time for you to write it down? And then carry your journal with you everywhere you go. Because you never ever know what may happen, what could come about. And you need to document it. So journaling is very, very important. Tomorrow, by the grace of God, we want to look at some people who history only came to know because they journal. For example, there is a lady by the name of Marie Curry. I had not heard that name before until I started to study. Marie Curry. Who was Marie Curry? Marie Curry between 1867 and 1934, was a chemist and a nuclear physicist. If she had not journaled what she was going through, what was happening in her life, we'd never ever know of a Marie Curie. Journaling helps the people in the future to know that you existed today. It's not just enough to look at your tombstone, tombstone and say you were born on this day and you die on that day. What did you do? Believe it or not, all of us are making a contribution to this universe. Why? As long as the spirit of God is in you, you are making a difference and you need to take the time to write it down in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.